So microcephaly can have a wide and varying impact. So what will happen is that the child's brain will not develop in the normal way. So they're likely to have big intellectual impairments, so they'll have difficulties learning and so on. But it can also be broader than that, so some of the children will also have difficulties with walking and moving and other kinds of functions. Microcephaly can also affect other organs, so there is some suggestion that the children will have difficulties with seeing as well. And all of that will become clearer as the kids become a bit older. And all of that means that they will likely have more difficulties doing a range of different things, so in having friends and social interactions and talking and schools um, and attending schools, so that will impact later down the lives whether or not they can have jobs and so on. There's also going to be a big impact on their families, the families who look after these children, um, both in terms of practically the amount of time that they'll have to spend looking after the children, but also emotional impact. Microcephaly was uh, detected in Brazil for the first time, a big increase in microcephaly. And the suggestion was done very soon that it was a consequence of congenital infection, i.e. the microcephaly was a manifestation of congenital Zika syndrome one of the manifestations. But microcephaly was easy to identify and that was used for surveillance. And uh, uh, it started with a few doctors noticing small increases. I had two babies with microcephaly in a month. I only have one a year normally. And they started talking. The neurologist receiving the cases uh, reported to the Department of Health, the department to the Ministry of Health, who then called a meeting. Um, and uh, by that time, it was clear there was a big increase in microcephaly. Um, how to take it from there? It was a new disease. Uh, there were hypotheses. And how to investigate? So the, the first uh, steps were to define what was going to be notifiable. So they set up a special notification system. And it was babies with microcephaly in utero or at birth. But they also notified pregnant women with a rash, which was a very sensible thing to do because it allowed monitoring the, the occurrence of the epidemic. They also set up notifications for Guillain-Barré. Um, and then the question was how to identify causality. How do we know that this is really uh, congenital Zika syndrome? There was a lot against it. There's never been a flavovirus or a mosquito transmitted virus causing congenital infection. That was new. So we have to go beyond they never happened before, therefore that's not it. Um, and uh, it's in fact, uh, the, the last time there was an epidemic of congenital infections were uh, rubella oh, in a certain degree cytomegalovirus, but it's never been anything like this. Who declares causality. So some interesting aspects. One is the Brazilian government decided there was a causal link between Zika and microcephaly in November. Uh, but the rest of the world was more reticent and were looking for, for more evidence. And then of course the evidence, it was both uh, laboratory findings and uh, a very strong evidence is the finding of microcephaly in countries that had epidemic of Zika but haven't at the time detected. So when Brazil said, we think it's microcephaly, it's caused by Zika, then the question was why wasn't any microcephaly in the French Polynesia where there was a big outbreak? And then they went back and looked and found. And I think that's a beautiful example of uh, proposing a hypothesis and testing the hypothesis. So I think that was very strong evidence. For me, that was the evidence that clinched it. And I think what's interesting is how the degree of certainty was changing during the process. So um, when the public health emergency was declared, they say there's a um, strong suggestion, there's no proof of causality, but we cannot find any other hypothesis, so let's take public health actions based on that. Uh, and, uh, and as evidence was slowly accumulating, you can look at every situation report from WHO, how the language is changing slightly, uh, becoming more and more um, convinced of the strength of the evidence. And then the last sentence said, um, there is a scientific consensus that the, the link is causal. So I think that's a, this is a very interesting uh, process to look at. The impact of microcephaly uh, on the children and their families will probably be quite big.
and that will have a wider impact on the community and society in general. So those children have rights. They have the right to attend school, they have the right to healthcare, they have the right to um, be involved in the job market and so on. So communities and society will have to adapt to welcome them and be able to include them in those activities. Um, those children are likely to have quite big healthcare needs and so they will, um, that will impact on the health services. Um, which will also have kind of costs attached to that. The families um, may have to adapt their lives because of the baby that they have, so they may have to take time out of the job or work in a different way so that they can look after their baby and child as grow up and there might be adaptations needed there and an overall economic cost that comes from these babies. A lot of the Zika focus and attention has been on prevention of Zika on how to try and um, diagnose Zika, how to stop the mosquitoes and so on and that's very important but at the same time attention needs to shift towards the needs of the babies and their families born to Zika infected mothers and attention needs to be given there to work out how to best meet those needs which may also require more research and attention and just providing physiotherapy which is often what is being done at the moment will not really meet the needs of those children and their families. More will need to be done.